Genesis chapter 9 and verse number 20. And this is after the flood. This is right after the flood. It says, And Noah began to be an husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. And he drank the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brother brethren without. And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. And their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. And Noah awoke from his wine and knew not what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. This is the tragedy following the flood. If you'd write this down in your handout, Noah became drunk from his own vineyard. You know, if, this, if the flood were the end of the story, it would be a wonderful story. But unfortunately, there is a tragedy following the flood. And the tragedy is that Noah became drunk from his own vineyard. Now, I want to say, first of all, that what we see here, if you'd look this way after you write that down, this is the first case of drunkenness that we find in the Bible. The first case of drunkenness that we find in the Bible. I find it interesting that in the first case of drunkenness that we find in the Bible, it involved a believer, not an unbeliever. Now, that's sad to me. And I'll tell you why. I had a man tell me one time that a Christian is not capable of committing a grievous sin. He said, now, I think that a Christian might be able to commit a small sin or a minor sin. But I don't think that a Christian could commit a grievous sin. I just don't think that, the, that a true Christian could ever do something like that. Well, first of all, I don't know how he defined a small sin or a minor sin and how he defined a grievous sin, but I do know this. I know that if a believer allows himself to walk after the flesh rather than to walk after the Spirit, that a believer is capable of doing anything that an unbeliever is capable of doing. Now, we read about that in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, walk in the spirit that you might not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. And then it gives a list of those things that defines the lusts of the flesh. And the reason that that that, that chapter was written to believers and not to unbelievers is that believers are capable of doing that which an unsaved person is capable of doing if we do not allow ourselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God every day. So the first case of drunkenness that we find involves a believer, not an unbeliever. I want to stop right here and I want to say this. There's no way that I could pass up this section of our study without mentioning this. I've been in the ministry now in some form or fashion for 35 years. I started in the ministry in 1978. So I've been working closely with people in the ministry for 35 years And I don't mind going on record making this statement. I I know there are a lot of people that try to defend the use of beverage alcohol. But I can tell you from a pastor's perspective, I have never seen one good thing come from beverage alcohol. I, I wish those who defend drinking had to catch the tears that my wife and I have to catch in my office as we deal with the marriages that have broken apart because of alcohol, that, that being the primary contributing factor, or the, or the children that have gone astray, or the lives that have been ruined, and the primary contributing factor was beverage alcohol. I like what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, beverage alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. I find it interesting <clears throat> that there is not a There is not a huge cry in America against the beverage alcohol industry in light of how many people are killed as a direct result of that industry. And I want to use this as an illustration. And please don't think that I'm being insensitive because I'm not. But recently, when that terrible shooting took place in Connecticut, I think it was 27 people died. Is that right? Was it 27? 27 people lost their lives and 21 of them were children. But now wait a minute. 
and I don't have statistics for last year. The most recent statistics I could find were from 2009. But in 2009, listen, in 2009, and I'm sure it's probably was about the same in 2010 and about the same in 11 and about the same in 2012. But in 2009, 181 children under the age of 14 were killed by drunk drivers. Now, it's a terrible thing that 21 children lost their lives in Connecticut, and now we've got this huge outcry against guns. Here's my question. Who's crying out against the alcohol industry? That's my question. 181 children under the age of 18, or under the age of 14, killed in one year because of beverage alcohol. Listen to this statistic. In that same year, 2009, on New Year's Day alone, on New Year's Day, from, from midnight of New Year's Eve to midnight of New Year's Day, 187 people were killed by drunk drivers in one day. Now, we've got this huge outcry because 27 people were shot down in one day. And again, I'm not being insensitive. That was a tragedy. That was a terrible thing. And our heart grieves for those people. But 28 people killed in one day because of gun violence. 187 people killed in one day by drunk drivers. New Year's Day of 2009. Now, again, we've got all of this outcry against guns. Who's crying out against the beverage alcohol industry? And so we find here that, that, that Noah got drunk. Noah got drunk, and Noah became the first drunkard. They say that a man is known by the company he keeps. As a matter of fact, many years ago, there was a liquor ad that actually had that as their slogan. They were promoting their, promoting their brand of beverage alcohol, and their slogan was, a man is known by the company he keeps. And the whole idea of the ad was, if you drink our brand of liquor then you can have the kind of classy friends that this man has dressed up in this tuxedo pictured in this ad. And you can have the beautiful girls that he has if you drink our brand of alcohol. A man is known by the company he keeps. I found a little poem uh, in connection with that, and uh, it goes like this. I think you'll enjoy this. One evening in October, when I was far from sober and dragging home a load of manly pride... My poor feet began to stutter, and I fell down in the gutter when a pig came up and laid down by my side. And then I warbled, it's fair weather when good fellows get together, till a lady passing by was heard to say, you can tell a man who boozes by the company he chooses. And the pig got up and quickly ran away. Now that's humorous, but there's nothing humorous about this story. The most frequently asked question about this story is this. What terrible sin prompted this curse? What terrible sin did Noah's son commit? The Bible is not clear about what sin was committed here, but many Bible scholars believe that it was a sin, that that it was actually the sin of homosexuality that Noah's son actually sodomized his own father. And they believe that for basically three reasons. Number one... Bible scholars tell us that the Hebrew language seems to indicate that. They tell us, number two, the phrase nakedness of his father used in verse 22 is definitely connected with the sexual immorality that is mentioned in Leviticus 18 and uh, and also chapter 20. The third reason, they say, is because Ham's son, Canaan, was the the one that was cursed. Look look at it, if you would, in verse number uh, 25. He said, Cursed be Canaan, that would be the son of Ham. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. The third reason that they believed that that it was this type of sin is because Ham's son, Canaan, was the progenitor of the Canaanite people, which later populated the area that we call Palestine. And the Canaanites were well known for their sexual perversion. As a matter of fact, it was the descendants of Canaan that established the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now look again, if you would, at verses 28 and 29. These verses are very sad. These may be two of the saddest verses in the Bible. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. 
And all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So Noah dies under letter B. Noah dies at the age of 950. And you say, why are these verses so sad? Well, the ultimate tragedy is seen in his life, if you look under letter C, in the fact that no spiritual accomplishments whatsoever are recorded during his final 350 years. No spiritual accomplishments are recorded in Noah's last 350 years. In other words, the last, the last three and a half centuries of Noah's life are a great big spiritual zero. They are a void. And so H.L. Wilmington put it this way. I don't have it on the screen, but H.L. Wilmington put it this way. He said, it seems that this brave and faithful man who once walked with God, who was used because of his powerful faith, went out not as a spiritual lion, but as a lamb, all because of sin all because of sin and it seems that after 600 years of serving God faithfully that has that Noah has nothing to show for the last three and a half centuries of his life may I tell you ladies and gentlemen this is an admonition to all of us to finish well you remember when I was preaching from the book of Daniel I encouraged all of us to finish well and I said the most amazing thing about Daniel is that he stayed faithful year after year decade after decade and there was never a time in Daniel's life when he dipped his sails spiritually Daniel came on the scene strong and Daniel left strong and I think we should all have a desire to end our life that way amen one of the things that really breaks my heart is when people get to a certain age and they're still relatively healthy they're still able to serve the Lord but for some reason they feel that they have earned a position in life where they no longer have to serve the Lord. And how many times have I heard people say, well, you know, I've done such and such, I've taught this class, or I've served in this capacity, or I've done this, or I've done that. I've, I've put in my time now. Let's let some of the young men do it. Let's let some of the young people do it now. There's nothing wrong with letting the young people do it, but you need to stay by the stuff so the young people can learn from you. Because you have something that they don't have, which is experience. And that's one of the reasons that I am so blessed to be able to pastor a church where there are so many senior saints that continue to be actively involved in ministry. Literally, we have senior saints involved in virtually every area of this ministry. And I can't begin to tell you how much that blesses me. And many of the senior saints in this church have this attitude. I'm not going to retire. I'm going to refire. And I love that attitude. I love that mindset. And I just want to say my hat's off to you because you are a great example to the next generation coming on that we not only want to start well, we want to end well. All right, now, that finishes up Noah. I want you to turn the page, and I want to spend most of our time tonight talking about the Tower of Babel. And this falls under the letter C. This this falls under confusion, the Bible in 20 Cs. This falls under confusion. So what did the first C stand for? Anybody remember? creation what did the second c stand for corruption what did the third c stand for captain noah and now we have confusion and so let's begin looking at the tower of babel tonight and let's read in genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9 it says and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. All right, if you look under number one, after the flood, God commanded man to scatter abroad 
to replenish and to fill the earth. Let me explain, after you write that down, if you look this way, let me explain what's happening here. The ark rested, the ark rested on a ledge of Mount Ararat. Now, that is in an area that we know of as Turkey. And it was several miles from Mesopotamia, where Shem, Ham, and Japheth and the descendants of Noah, the children of Noah, were from. No doubt, after they left the ark and began to reproduce, no doubt, Shem, Ham, and Japheth began to talk to their children and their grandchildren and their great-grandchildren about what life was like back in Mesopotamia. And so apparently the descendants of these men decided that they would travel to Mesopotamia in order to see this place. And so when they got there, they decided to engage in a massive building project. Now, I want to set something straight. When the Bible says that they decided to build a tower that would reach into heaven, in the original Hebrew, it actually says reach unto heaven. In other words... Listen, they were not trying to build a tower that went all the way up into outer space. I used to think that when I first got saved. I used to read that and think, how stupid could these people be to think they could build a tower that went all the way to the moon and then step off of that tower onto the moon? That's not what they're trying to do. They're not that silly. They know they can't do that. But rather, this is a tower that is to reach unto the heavens. What this actually is, is a tower that was dedicated to their Babylonian religion. And their Babylonian religion was astrology. Now, let me give you the world's definition of astrology. This is the dictionary definition of astrology. The dictionary will tell you this, that astrology is the supposed influence of the stars and the planets on human affairs. I'm amazed at how many people I have met in my life, and in some cases, church people who call themselves Christians, who consult their horoscopes on a regular basis. And they actually seek guidance from the alignment of the stars and the planets. I'm also amazed at how many Christians I have met who place great emphasis on the so-called signs of the zodiac. And when they meet somebody, the first thing they want to know is, what sign were you born under? Are you a Virgo? Are are you a Leo? Are you a Pisces? Are you a Sagittarius? What sign? And they think that the sign that you were born under, which is really just an, uh, an arbitrary division that someone created concerning the position of the sun, is totally arbitrary. It's not rooted in science or astronomy whatsoever. It's a totally arbitrary division dividing the movement of the sun in 12 equal parts. And they actually believe that where the sun and the moon and the earth was located when you were born is going to affect your personality. And I know people that actually will make decisions based on what their horoscope says. Now, here's the sad thing about that. Here's the sad thing about that. That's the dictionary definition. Let me give you the definition from God's word. Are you ready? Here's what God's word says about astrology. It is the heathen worship of the heavens. It is worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Can I have an amen? Why would we want to seek signs? Why would, not signs, but why would we want to seek guidance from the creation when we have a relationship with the creator? Why would would we want to seek guidance from some outside source source such as the planets when we have the holy spirit of god living inside of us do you realize that to seek guidance in this way is an insult to almighty god because the bible says it is the holy spirit that does what he leads us and he guides us and he directs our steps now here's my point the study of astrology goes all the way back to ancient babylon And many Bible scholars, matter of fact, all conservative Bible scholars that I know of concur that the Tower of Babel was a monument to the study of astrology. Not astronomy, which is a valid science, but astrology, which is the worshiping of the stars and the planets. I'll give you an interesting fact. They have found the ruins of ancient Babylon. You do know that, don't you? 
Where was ancient Babylon located? What is the name of the country today? It is Iraq. They have found and excavated the ancient ruins of Babylon. One of the things they found is a tower that is 153 feet high. It is 400 feet wide at the base. And it is built in seven layers, which would correspond with the seven known planets at that time. And each layer seems to have been colored with pigment to correspond with the color of that planet as it appears. Black for Saturn, orange for Jupiter, red for Mars, and so on and so forth. And here's the interesting thing about this tower that they have excavated. There is, there is a huge summit at the top of this tower, and in that summit, they have actually found carved into the stone and into the granite the signs of the zodiac. And, and so this ancient form of pagan worship goes all the way back to ancient Babylon. And we're not saying that they have uncovered the ruins of the Tower of Babel. Most likely they have not. Most likely it was some form of an imitation that came after the Tower of Babel. But the interesting fact about this, ladies and gentlemen, is that they weren't trying to actually build into outer space. They were actually seeking guidance from something other than the worship of the true God. Now, I want to show you what the famous commentator Donald Barnhouse said about this. Let's put it on the screen. Donald Barnhouse said, and I quote, It was an open, defiant, he's talking about the Tower of Babel. It was an open, defiant turning to Satan and the beginning of devil worship. This is why the Bible everywhere pronounces a curse on those who consult the sun, the moon, and the stars of heaven. Now look at verse 4. Chapter 11, verse number 4. It says, And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make, or whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now look this way. This is pure, unadulterated rebellion against God, and here's why. They're trying to find a way to keep the population of the earth together in a central location. But what has God specifically commanded them to do? To scatter. To move abroad and to fill the earth. This flies in the face of what God has clearly commanded. It is pure, unadulterated rebellion. As a matter of fact, if you'll study what conservative Bible scholars have to say about this event, almost without exception, they will tell you that what you have here is a picture or a type or a foreshadow of the one world government that's coming in the last days. This is a picture of man's first attempt at one world government. That's actually what this is. The Tower of Babel is man's first attempt at one world religion and one world government. This is intended to be a picture of the one world government which is going to come at the end of days, which we studied about in detail when we went through the book of Daniel. Not only that, but let's talk about the man that led this. Go to chapter 10. Go back to chapter 10. And notice what it says in chapter 10. And in chapter 10, we read about a man named Nimrod. And uh, let's see, I didn't write, there it is, uh, verse 8. Look at verse 8. It says, and Cush begat Nimrod and began to be a what? A mighty one, underline the word mighty one in the earth. Now, still talking about Nimrod, he was a what? A mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the what? Mighty hunter before the Lord. All right, now, how many times is the word mighty used? It's used three times. I think it's obvious this is no ordinary man. And again, if you'll study what conservative Bible scholars have to say about this, they will tell you that even though he was mighty, it never says, listen, it never says that he was mighty, that he was a mighty man of God. It simply says that he was mighty. And what most conservative Bible scholars will tell you is that Nimrod is a picture of the Antichrist. That Nimrod is the man that actually led this rebellion. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here's my whole point. Are you listening tonight? When it comes to this idea of one world religion and one world government and rebellion against God, listen, God hated it then, 
and God hates it now. As a matter of fact, let me tell you what the Bible says. As I said a moment ago, this is pure, unadulterated rebellion against God. And let me tell you what the Bible says about rebellion. The Bible says that rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. We are never more like Satan than when we rebel against authority. And yet, I think you'll agree with me that we are living in the day of rebellion. Right? For example, wives do not think twice these days about rebelling against the authority of their husband in the home in the name of women's lib. Now, let me be quick to say that submission on the part of a wife to her husband does not mean that she's inferior. And that's where the misconception comes in. Many have the idea that if I submit to him, I'm admitting that I'm inferior. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus is equal with God. God the Son, equal with God the Father. And yet the Bible also says that God the Son submitted to the will of God the Father. So if submission means inferiority, then that would be the same as saying that Christ was inferior to God. And that would be blasphemy. So submission does not mean inferiority. Basically what it comes down to is this. God knows that any organization, whether you're talking about a home, whether you're talking about a church, whether you're talking about a business, no organization can possibly function properly without a chain of command. It's got to be based upon an understanding of authority. We're living in a day and time when many men do not think twice about rebelling against the authority of their employer. They talk bad about their employer. They say things behind his back. They say things that, 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 that especially a believer should not say. For the Bible says that when it comes to our relationship with our employer, whether you call him foreman, whether you call him supervisor, whether he's the owner, whether you call him boss, whatever you call him, the Bible teaches that if you are under the authority of someone at work, you are to work for him as though Christ himself were standing there. And it doesn't say anything about whether or not he's a good boss or a bad boss. It doesn't say anything about whether he's fair or unfair. It doesn't say anything about whether he's a nice guy or a jerk. It just says you submit to his authority as unto the Lord as if Christ himself were standing there. We see rebellion in the home. We see rebellion in the workplace. And it's sad to say, but many times we even see rebellion within the context of the local church. And that's always a sad thing. The Bible says that God has given the church pastors. God has given the church men to lead them. And, and, uh, and, and, and not in this church, but it's rare that we hear about something like this happening in this church. But so many times people have this attitude, well, I don't want to follow the leadership of the pastor. I want to do my own thing. And, and I'm not talking about a pastor that's gone off into sin. I'm not saying that a pastor is unaccountable. A pastor is very accountable. Number one, a pastor is accountable to God. Secondly, a pastor is accountable to the congregation. Every time I stand up and preach, I'm accountable to you. And if I ever get into a situation where I'm preaching something that would not be considered doctrinally sound, you would have every right and not just the right, but the responsibility to approach me and to correct me. So I'm not saying the pastor is unaccountable, but I'm saying while the pastor is trying to lead the flock of God, it is a sad thing when people just decide just for the sake of rebellion, I'm not going to follow, I don't want to do it that way. I heard a few, it's been several years ago, but I heard a, when Brother Tom was over the Sunday school about a Sunday school teacher that actually made this statement to another teacher. They actually said, well, I know Brother Tom wants us to do it that way, but i just tell you right now, I'm not going to. May I tell you, that's just pure rebellion. Now, had they said, Brother Tom wants us to do it this way, but I think I might have a better idea, and I'm going to talk to him about it. There would be nothing wrong with that. But to just say, well, the pastor wants me to do it this way, but I'm not going to. It's just, just pure rebellion. I'm not trying to defend my position tonight. I don't need to do that. We don't have any major problems in this church in this area that I know of. I'm not saying this for my benefit. I'm saying this for all of our benefit. Because we need to know that, listen, God can't bless a rebellious spirit. I don't care if it's at home. I don't care if it's at work. I don't care if it's at church. God will not bless a spirit of rebellion. The Bible says it's like the sin of witchcraft. A few years ago, I, thought, I always laugh when I think about this. A few years ago, I was having lunch with a pastor. And um, I think he heard me on the radio because he was not a close friend. I had just met him. 
and he asked if he could have lunch with me, and I said, well, I'd love to. And we sat down, and I told you this years ago, most of you probably don't remember it or you weren't here. He said, uh, he sat down, he said, preacher, I need advice. I said, all right, what do you need advice on? He said, preacher, I'm pastoring the biggest bunch of rebels you ever saw. I said, well, I can't relate to that because I have a, a really good church. I said, but just tell me. He said, well, he said, I'll just give you an example. He said, we're out of room. He said, our church is small. We're a country church. And I've been working hard and inviting people. And, and the building's getting full. And, and he said, every service, this was in the dead of winter. He said, every service, people come in the building and they sit down. And then they put their winter coat in the seat beside them. And it takes up two spaces, one for them and one for their coat. And he said, the other night in Sunday night, I just very nicely asked them. Would you all mind to hang up your coats so that your coat doesn't take up room where a person could sit? He said, you wouldn't believe the firestorm I started. He said, it was unbelievable. Preacher, we've been sitting beside our coats for 50 years. And we ain't going to quit now. I'm a patient man, but... <laughs> I have my limits, and I'm not sure that I could have endured that situation. But I couldn't help but think about that when I think of an extreme case of just out-and-out rebellion within the context of the church. And what you have here in the Tower of Babel is just pure, unadulterated rebellion against God. That's under number two, by the way. Babylon was a city conceived in rebellion, the seat of the first great apostasy. And I hope you'll write that down under number two. Babylon was a city conceived in rebellion, the seat of the first great apostasy. So here's what happened. Let's look at it. Verse 5. Look at verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get to heaven, there are certain scenes that I would like to see on video. You know, if the Lord would just replay them for us on a big screen, there are certain things I would like to see on video. This is one of them. I mean, here they are building this great, huge monument, not for the glory of God, but for the glory of man, and and the foreman's barking out orders, go get this, and go get that, and do this, and do that. And just, I mean, that quick, he looks at some guy and says, And the guy says, huh? And then another guy looks at him and says, Huh? Huh? Last Sunday, I was downstairs, and David Meyer walked through with his little boy, Mason. And I knelt down and I said, Mason, how old is Mason, two? I knelt down and I said, Mason, I want to ask you a question. And he said, okay. I said, if the two sides of an isosceles triangle are equal to the sum of the square, then what would be the hypotenuse junction of the remainder? And he looked at me and he goes, the remainder? And that's all, all week I've been looking at David Meyer and I've been saying, the remainder? I want to read to you what the German theologian Eric Sauer, Eric Sawyer, had to say about this. He said, quote, The original language in which Adam in paradise had named all the animals was, as it were, a great mirror in which the whole of nature was accurately reflected. But now God shattered this mirror, and each people retained only a fragment of it, the one a larger, the other a smaller piece. And now each people sees only a piece of the whole, but never the whole completely and what he is saying ladies and gentlemen is this he's saying that he believes that in every language on earth today there is at least some similarity to the original language that god gave to adam which was transmitted of course all the way down to noah and his family and then to the descendants of shem ham and japheth and he's saying that some languages would be more similar to the original language than others but he's saying that he believes and i don't know if he's right or not but it's interesting to think about he believes that in every language on earth today that there is at least a fragment 
of the original language. And that's something else I look forward to to finding out when we get to heaven is what language did God give Adam and Eve? What did that language sound like? What was the original language given by God in heaven to man? Now, any study on the Tower of Babel would not be complete without quickly looking at a comparison of the Tower of Babel with the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Here's why. Because in both cases, it was a miracle of languages. Now, when I talk about the day of Pentecost, how many of you all know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about when the disciples had prayed for 10 days, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt them, and they began to speak in foreign languages that they had not previously learned. And the Bible says that the people that had gathered in the city from every nation could understand the gospel not only in his, listen, not only in his own language, but the Bible says in his own dialect. Because many languages have several dialects. For example, if you, uh, they tell me that in China, there are several different dialects. And even though it may be considered the same language, one dialect is so different from another that you could really hardly even compare the two. I can relate to that in that my mother is from Louisiana. And easy, (laughs) don't go to meddling, right? But it's amazing how different the dialect is in Louisiana than it is, for example, in Rockford, Illinois, where my dad was from. And when my dad's family in Rockford, Illinois, would speak to my mom's family in Louisiana, sometimes it was almost as though they spoke two different languages. And it's amazing how not only is the accent different, but they even use words differently. I had an aunt, for example, if you want to take somebody to town... In Louisiana, you don't take them to town. What do you do? You carry them to town. And I'll never forget one time I had an aunt that was quite heavy. And I'll never forget her asking my dad. She said, Don, would you carry me to town? And I remember thinking, Dad, I don't think you can. (laughs) But the Bible says every man heard, on the day of Pentecost, every man heard in his own language. Now that means those those that were from the north, They heard the disciples say, Ewans need to get saved. And those that were from the south, I'm sorry, I meant southeast Missouri. That's southeast Missouri. In southeast Missouri, they heard the disciples say, Ewans need to get saved. In the north, Rockford, Illinois, where I was born, they heard the disciples say, you guys need to get saved. But in Louisiana, what'd they hear? Y'all need to get saved. And so every man heard on the day of Pentecost in his own language. So the Tower of Babel was a miracle of languages. The day of Pentecost was a miracle of languages. Now let's draw a contrast between these two miracles. And I'm just going to read through these quickly because I have something else I want to cover. First of all, at the Tower of Babel, sinful men gathered in their own name. It was not for the glory of God. It was for the glory of man. But on the day of Pentecost, saved men gathered together in the name of Jesus. Number two, at the Tower of Babel, God confound, confounds their language. On the day of Pentecost, God clarifies their language. And then number three, at the Tower of Babel, God scatters man because of sin. But on the day of Pentecost, God gathers men together for salvation. Now write this down at the bottom of the page. This caused them to separate from each other and relocate to different areas of the earth. And here we have the separation of languages and nations. Now I want to give you some things quickly that are not in your notes. And you can use that space that's left over on your paper to write these things down. And they all begin with the letter M. And we're going to put this under the heading Tower of Babel or Tower of Blunders. And I want to show you five tragic mistakes that were made at the Tower of Babel. I promised you when I began this series this time around that I would always add new material. That it would not be the same as it was last time. Six years ago or seven years ago. So I want to add some things now that I think will be a blessing to you. And these are five tragic mistakes that were made at the Tower of Babel. If you ever want to teach a Sunday school lesson on the Tower of Babel, some of you teachers. Or if you ever want to do a Bible study on the Tower of Babel. These five things will, will, will formulate a wonderful outline concerning the Tower of Babel. 
Number one, they began with the wrong motive. Notice what it says in verse four. And every time you see the word us or we, I want you to count. Or they, either us, they, or we. All right, verse four, you ready? And read it out loud. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. How many is that? Six references to themselves. What's missing here? There's no reference to God. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the birthplace of humanism. I want to define humanism and I'm going to put it on the screen. Humanism is the viewpoint that human happiness is its own justification and requires no sanction or support from supernatural sources. I want you to read that out loud with me. Ready? The viewpoint that human happiness is its own justification and requires no sanction or support from supernatural sources. In other words, be happy and leave God out of it. How many of you all can quote the Lord's Prayer? Let's do it together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom. And Did I leave something out? And give us this day our daily bread. And deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, somebody has rewritten that, and I wrote it down because I wanted to read it to you verbatim. Someone said that if a humanist were going to quote the Lord's Prayer, this is how it would go. Our brothers, which are on earth, hallowed be our name. Our kingdom come, our will be done on earth without any help from heaven. Because ours is the kingdom, and ours is the power, and ours is the glory forever. Amen. One of the saddest days in human history was 1945 when the Charter of the United Nations was written. And there is not one mention of God in it. They left it out on purpose and they did so for two reasons. Number one, to appease the communists. And number two, to appease the humanists. And so basically they said, we can have world peace and leave God out of it. And since 1945, there has never been a more comparable period of war. They had the wrong motive. Their motive for the Tower of Babel was not the glory of God. It was the glory of man. They had the wrong motive. Number two, they had the wrong materials. Notice what it says in verse 3. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime they had for mortar. Now again, they weren't trying to build this into outer space. They were building it under the heavens. And this was a shrine to their Babylonian religion, which was astrology. And so here they are trying to reach the heavens with brick and mortar using what they had. Listen, using what they had rather than seeking God's help. Now, what are men doing today? They're basically doing the same thing. Can I have an amen? We don't need God. We have our minds. We have our machines. We have our money. We don't need God. One scientist was recently quoted as saying this verbatim. The world picture of the nuclear age does not include God. And just as they worshipped at the shrine of brick and mortar, today men are worshipping at the shrine of their own minds. And I want to tell you, it is just as foolish. It is just as foolish. Number three, they had the wrong mentality. They had the wrong mentality. Notice what it says again in verse 3. I want you to read out loud the very first phrase in verse 3. Ready? And they said one to another. You know what they're doing here? They're pooling their ignorance. And they said one to another, there's no word from God here. Listen, 
Did you know there's a big difference between the wisdom of man and the wisdom of God? The wisdom of man often sounds so good and it sounds so logical, but it flies in the face of what the Word of God says. When I was going through 1 Corinthians and I got to chapter 3, I did an entire message on that. The wisdom of God versus the wisdom of man. And so under the wrong mentality, I want to give you, and I hope you'll jot them down, the four pillars of humanism. These are the four pillars of humanism. Number one, the first pillar of humanism is atheism. Now the word atheism has a negative connotation, so they've changed it to humanism. On Dragnet, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. But here the names have been changed to protect the guilty. Atheism has a negative connotation. So they've changed it to humanism. But make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, humanism is basically atheism. I want to read to you a quote from Dr. Corliss Lamont. You say, well, who is Corliss Lamont? He is a leading spokesman for humanism. And he wrote a definitive book titled Philosophy of Humanism. He said, and I quote, Humanism believes that nature itself constitutes the sum total of reality, that matter slash energy and not mind is the foundation stuff of the universe and that supernatural entities simply do not exist. This non-reality of the supernatural means on the human level that men do not possess supernatural and immortal souls and on the level of the universe as a whole that our cosmos does not possess a supernatural and eternal God. And then this man goes on to say, for humanism, the central concern is always the happiness of man in his existence. Not some fanciful never-never land beyond the grave. A happiness worthwhile is an end in itself and not subordinate to nor dependent on a supreme deity, an invisible king ruling over the earth and the infinite cosmos. Now you may say, who cares what Cloris Lamont thinks? You would be surprised if you knew how many powerful people in this world have signed the Humanist Manifesto. And you would be surprised if you knew how this philosophy is permeating our public schools. We'll talk about that more here in just a moment. The second great pillar of humanism is evolution. Since they have decided there's no God, they have to explain explain man's existence apart from God, and that's evolution. Number three is amorality, no fixed standard of right or wrong. It's the idea that man is an animal. And what does an animal live for? Look this way. What does an animal live for? Self-preservation. Somebody said to eat. Self-preservation. What else? To reproduce. Self-propagation. And what else? Self-gratification. Whatever makes him feel good. That's what animals live for. Self-preservation. Self-propagation. Self-gratification. And they say that man is just a highly evolved animal. Therefore, the humanist says that man is a slave to these three things. Now, lest you think I'm exaggerating, I was recently watching a television show on the Discovery Channel on the human animal. And uh, they began to talk about human sexuality. And if I hadn't heard this with my own ears, I wouldn't believe it. But they actually said on this television show, That the reason that men and women find it hard to be faithful in marriage is that evolution has not programmed us to be monogamous. That evolution has programmed us to try to propagate our seed in as many ways and with as many people as possible. And so they say, really, they say the whole concept of marriage and the whole concept of monogamy is really contrary to the way evolution has programmed us. Well, may I tell you, program, uh, evolution has not programmed us. We were programmed by Almighty God. It is sin and the flesh that desires the lusts of the flesh. And yet there is victory in Christ over the flesh. We talked about that earlier. The Humanist Magazine says this, and I quote, Darwin's discovery of evolution sounded the death knell of religious and moral values. It removed the ground from under the feet of traditional religion. By the way, what has been the result? What has been the result of this philosophy being promoted just in the U.S., for example, within the last 50, 60 years? What's been the result? A dramatic increase in sexual permissiveness, right? Abortion on demand, a flood of pornography, a flood of filth, a flood of drugs... And a divorce rate that has gone from one out of seven in 19, in nineteen 
40 to 1 out of 2. That's what this mindset has gotten us. Again, I want to quote from Cloris Lamont. He said, and I quote, For humanism, no human acts are good or bad in and of themselves. Whether an act is good or bad is to be judged by its consequences for the individual and society. Knowledge of the good, then, must be worked out like knowledge of anything else. Through the examination and evaluation of the concrete consequences of an idea or hypothesis. Humanist ethics draw its guiding principles from human experience and test them in human experience. Does that sound familiar? Where have you heard that before? Genesis 3, the Garden of Eden. That is almost word for word what Satan said to Eve. Go ahead and taste it. Find out for yourself. If you like it, you can have some more. If it's good, you can have some more. If it's bad, then you'll know it. But you need to make up your own mind. And then the fourth pillar of humanism is the deification of man. And the watchword of human, look look this way, the watchword of humanism is happiness. You read about that over and over and over again in their literature. That's their ultimate goal, happiness, the happiness of man. Look this way. This may shock you, but did you know God's primary goal for your life is not that you be happy? It's that you be holy. Now, God's not against your happiness, but that's not his primary goal in your life. And as a matter of fact, sometimes they don't necessarily work hand in hand. I'm amazed at how many Christian parents that I talk to and I ask them, what's your goal for your children? And you know what they almost always, this is how brainwashed our culture has become. Do you know what even Christian parents almost always say, almost always without exception, when you say, what's your goal for your children? I don't care what they do. I don't care where they go. I just want them to be happy. It's been a long time since I've heard a Christian parent say, I don't care what they, where they go. I don't care what they become. I just want them to be holy. It's been a long time since I've heard that. And that's how brainwashed we've become with humanism. That's how warped our own worldview has become. That's how much it's been influenced without us even realizing it. Next week, we'll pick up with number four. Go ahead and put it on the screen. Next week, we'll pick up with number four, which is at the Tower of Babel, they had the wrong methods. They had the wrong methods. That's where we'll start next week.